Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a real honor and privilege to be here and, uh, and visit with you today. the only road to farm wealth. But I'm going to take the liberty of speaking about some other issues as, as well. <clears throat> I like to start my talk in every class I teach with this quote. This is my favorite quote. And if you don't believe this quote, you didn't hear the speaker last night. The human mind when stretched by a new idea, can never shrink to its original size. And golly, did he have an idea. It blew my mind. So I hope that somewhere during this conference, you've got a new idea and that your hat will not fit any longer. Before speaking about soil health, I want to talk just briefly about some big issues that really affects agriculture and the future of agriculture. <clears throat> the world changed in about 1950, shortly after World War II. The world really changed. And I want to just touch on some of those issues. The first is world population. You've all heard we're now at 7.3 billion people. In 1950, we were two and a half. We have tripled the population since 1950. Now you can see by this curve, it's an S-shaped curve. We are beginning to, that slope is, is going down now. But let's look at this in perspective. Let's go back 1,000 years. We were about 330 million people. We did not reach a billion people until the 1900s. Between 1950, it really shot up. And by the year 2100, we are going to begin leveling off. No question about that. I don't have time to go into all the details, but we will level off. But just look at the, the change in population during your lifetime. Now, more importantly, where are those people going to be? We're going to add two and a half billion people between now and 2050. 98% of them are going to be in the developing world. If you look here at the bottom, here we are, 2015. This is the developed countries, Europe, North America, Japan, Australia, Population is going to go down. The developing countries, and this has a tremendous amount to do with what our speakers talked about this morning about export, because many of those countries are going to need your wheat. <clears throat> Issue number two, food production. We've increased from two and a half billion to seven and a half. 7.3 billion. 50% of the calories of the world comes from grains. That's the reason it's so important to talk about grain. This is U.S. corn production, wheat production, and rice production, but what I want you to look at here is a corn production. It did not change from the late 1800s to 1950. Since 1950, the yield of corn has gone up, 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 and up. What
What have we done worldwide? We've done a remarkable job of feeding that increased population. This shows a grain production. This shows a per capita. This is grain per person. It increased very sharply until about the 1980s. Since then, it's been somewhat uniform. The population increased two and a half times during that period from 1961. The reason I start in 1961 here, this is the first year that FAO started publishing worldwide numbers, so I can only get the numbers back to 1961. But since 1961, population increased two and a half times, but food production increased 3.2 times. A remarkable achievement. They did that by increasing cropland only 10%. But irrigation area doubled and fertilizer went up 10 times. This is nitrogen, 1950. The end of World War II, they took the bomb factories that took anhydrous ammonia, or took nitrogen out of the air and made anhydrous ammonia, and then that became bombs. After World War II, those bomb factories became fertilizer factories and nitrogen fertilizer. And look how nitrogen fertilizer has increased since 1950. And cereal production has gone right up with it. We are not using that very efficiently. I've assumed 10% protein, and if we assume 10% protein and take all the grain in the world, we're only using 40 million tons, and yet we're adding 125 million tons every year out of the air That doesn't count what we're getting out of the soil or out of the anything else. So we're not using that nitrogen very efficiently. And we're going to have to do a better job because we're adding that many nutrients to the, in the environment every year. You've heard this. But by, 19, by 2050, we're going to have to increase food production about 70%, even though population is going to increase less than 30%. Why? Because as incomes go up worldwide, and we hope they do, 40% of the world live on less than $2 a day. We'd like to see them raise a little bit of money but that's going to have a tremendous effect on you and I. But they're going to increase because they want more animal protein. Issue number three, energy, energy, energy. Nineteen fifty. We increased Fossil fuels before 1950, but since 1950, it's gone straight up. Again, I don't have time to talk about those issues, but those are issues that affect you, affect agriculture, and you're going to deal with. Now, let's talk a little bit about soil health. Soil health... It's kind of a new term in many ways. Some of my soil science colleagues, their blood pressure goes up about 20 points if you mention soil health. They don't like that word at all. I like the word soil quality. But soil health, and, and I compliment the Canadians, I've got a book 20 years ago published, I think it was Ag Canada, that has soil health on the, on the cover. <clears throat> now in America, we're beginning to push soil health 
But the thing about soil health, it resonates with the public. Soil quality does not. Soil health resonates. What is soil health? Soil health is defined as the capacity of a soil to function. For you and me, that means increased yields in a sustainable manner. Now, there's different definitions and many tests for soil. Sometimes I think we over-test. I know this is oversimplifying, but to me, soil health can boil down pretty much to soil organic matter. Your soil organic matter is declining. Soil health is probably declining. If organic matter is increasing, Soil health is probably increasing because soil health or soil organic matter affects the chemical, the physical, and the chemical properties of soil. Now, when we take a new area, and we take that area, whether it's forest land or whether it's grassland, as you had, and you convert that to agriculture, there's going to be some certain degradation processes that start. You cannot stop them. You're going to have erosion, compaction. You're going to have some of those. But at the same time, you're going to try to put in some soil conservation practices to offset those. And soil health is either going to go up or down, depending. This picture could have been taken where I live and work about 150 years ago. And this picture could have probably been taken right here in Lethbridge 150 years ago, with one exception. Those buffalo would not have ear tags. <laughs> <laughs> but it was short grass. And then this is a poor picture. But it illustrates what I want to show you, and, and this is a breaking of the prairie in our area. I live in Amarillo, Texas, which is a long way south from here, but many, uh, many of the same attributes as, as you have here in Lethbridge. We broke that prairie. What you can't really see clearly is there's a moldboard plow up there at the front, and then that, behind that moldboard plow, there's a disc plow, tillage. Then we got tractors, more tillage. Then we put tillage behind tillage. We sowed wheat. We put a tiller in front of it. We sowed wheat. We put a tiller behind it. Tillage, tillage, tillage. It worked. Look what we produced. Pretty houses. Big barns, beautiful dresses for ladies. Wheat, more than waist high. It worked for a while. And then we got this. And this. And this is 2014. This happened up and down the Great Plains and even on Lethbridge. You had the Dust Bowl, not as bad. I live right here in the epicenter. What happened? This is three logs in a fireplace, in my fireplace in my home. You've all been there and done that. You strike a match and you burn, start burning these logs, you get a great big fire. And after a while, that fire begins to go down. And what do you do? You get a stoker and you stir it. And that fire goes back up. And then it comes back down. It doesn't go as high as it did the first time 
it comes back down, you stir it again. That's exactly what you do when you plow soil. Two things happen when you stir those logs. You add oxygen. You cannot have a fire without oxygen. Second thing you do is you create surface area. Those logs are like this. But you stir them, you stir them like this. So that carbon that was in here is now out here and it can be burned. And as you burn it, you create ashes. What's in those ashes when you burn organic matter? There's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, zinc, copper, all 18 elements that's required for that wheat or that corn, every element is in there. That's where those pretty dresses came from. They came from the ashes of that organic matter. And that lasts for several years. But all of a sudden we begin to run out of an ash. And the first ash we run out of is nitrogen. So we add some nitrogen and we say, my problem is solved. My yields went back up to where they were, almost. And that works until we run out of another ash. And then we add phosphorus. What we didn't add is organic matter. We begin to get things out of balance. So that organic matter is the most important thing that we have to work with. Because it not only furnishes those ashes for nutrients, but organic matter is a glue. Organic matter holds those particles together. And we lost that organic matter, that's when we got those dust storms. Because we've lost that glue that held them together. Organic matter makes sandy soils act like they've got some clay in them. Makes them less sandy. And it makes clay soils act like they're more sandy because that soil has structure. And that structure holds water. We had to change our tillage practices. And we used a sweep. And this sweep was developed right out here at Noble Ford by Charles Noble. Now let's turn to talk about water. Pete, in a very bashful way, said he talked about water and he put one slide up and says it's, it's all about the water. And then he talked like it wasn't all about the water. One of the talks I give, the title is, It's All About the Water. And I'm going to talk to you, and I don't know if Pete's here, he may send me to the airport. I'm here. <laughs> Go get him. Stay with me, Pete. It's all about the water. <clears throat> now, now, it's all about the water, and it starts with organic matter in the soil, soil health. Because the more organic matter we have in the soil, the more water we're going to hold. We're going to capture that water. 
and we're going to store it as plant available water. This shows you a sandy soil and a silt loam, but all I want you to look at there is as we increase organic matter, we're increasing soil water storage. Now, when you add water to the soil, there's five things that can happen to that water. It can run off, it can evaporate, it can drain below the east, below the root zone, it can remain in the root zone, or it can be used for transpiration. The only one that's going to put any money in your pocketbook is the transpiration. Now, in semi-arid areas, we don't worry very much about losing it below the root zone. And with good management, we can control the runoff. So I'm going to talk to you about evaporation, transpiration, and keeping it in the root zone. When it rains, water enters the soil and it's either evaporated or it's transpired. This is photosynthesis. You've heard about this. You, you know it. But let's, let's spend just a little time on basics so we can all stay together. Photosynthesis takes water out of the soil and carbon dioxide out of the air. and it makes carbohydrates and releases oxygen. That's a very simple process. This is a leaf. This is out of an FAO paper. It simply shows you that a leaf upside down with a stomata open. Now that leaf is wet because it's taken up water from the soil. So the inside of that leaf is pretty well saturated. The carbon dioxide is in the air. So the only way the plant can get carbon dioxide is to open a window. And when it opens a window so that carbon dioxide can go in, water is going to go out. It's just like opening your door, your window at your home. So you open that window to let the carbon dioxide in and you're going to have some water go out. And how much water goes out depends on how hot it is, how water, how windy it is, how sunny it is, and how dry the air is. I can say that real fast. My students get tired of hearing me say it. How hot it is, how windy it is, how sunny it is, how dry the air is. When I grow a corn plant in Texas and open a window, I lose a lot more water out of that corn plant than you do when you open it in Lethbridge. Now here's two cornfields, side by side, or they could be side by side. If you go to Weather Bureau and you measure how hot it is, how windy it is, how sunny it is, and how dry the air is, you'll get four numbers. But that's not at the plant leaf. Don't tell me that the, if you walk in that irrigated field, and measure how windy it is, how sunny it is, how dry the air is, and how hot it is. It's very different if you go out into that dry land field and ask that corn plant how hot it is, how windy it is. They're different.
they both got to take their open their windows to let that carbon dioxide in. Now, evapotranspiration, this is a big old long word, but we need to have a clear understanding of what I'm talking about when I go further here about ET. ET is the water used between the time you seed a crop and the time you harvest a crop that is lost from the system as transpiration or evaporation from the soil surface. And it's only the water that goes through that plant as transpiration that increases biomass. Now, Pete gave you an equation. I'm going to give you an equation, and I'm going to talk about it quite a bit more than Pete talked about his equation. This is grain yield is equal to ET times T over ET times 1 over TR times HI. These four factors are the only four factors that determine the yield of a grain crop. Now notice, I do not have fungicides listed. I do not have fertilizer listed. But Pete, this equation, go back and try it on your data when you get home. This is sound scientific. There's nothing new. I published this equation this year. But it's not, it's not my equation. Much of this has been done long ago. I don't know anybody else that's put it together quite in the same shape that I've put it here. But let's, let's look at this now. Grain yield is a pounds per acre. This is grain, or it could be kilograms, whatever you want to work with. ET now is the amount of water that's used during that cropping season. T over ET is a proportion of that that's used as transpiration as a ratio of the amount of the total amount used. The TR is the water that it takes to produce, the units of water it takes to produce one unit of biomass. And HA, HI is the harvest index. Now, fertilizer is going to affect those, yes. Fungicides may affect them. But this equation will calculate, and it'll work on data in Germany, or in, you talked about the yield in England. I've used this data. Now, if you're not growing, if you do not have irrigation, then the ET for your crop is going to be the amount of rainfall or precipitation you get between the time you plant and the time you harvest, plus what you take from the soil that you had water stored in the soil at the beginning. That's your limit. There is no other water. It's what occurs during the raining, during the growing season, plus what you take from the soil. The T over ET is a proportion that's used for transpiration, and that's the only one that counts, really. And if you've got a dryland crop, it's going to be maybe as low as 0.5. If you have an irrigated crop, that may go up to 0.75, or if you're in a real favorable rainfall area. <laughs> Go 
is look at the bare ground. If you've got a dry land crop, you're going to have more evaporation from the soil surface. You get a little bit of rain on those two fields. And the one there that's all, that's the irrigated crop, nearly all that water is going to be used for transpiration. But the water that's falling on that dryland crop, a lot of that's going to evaporate. It's not going to be used for transpiration. Now the harvest index, the harvest index is the amount of, and Pete mentioned this, the harvest index is the amount of grain divided by the biomass. And for a corn crop, we can get up to about 0.6, maybe even 0.62. But for a corn crop in a dry land, you can get a harvest index of zero. You can grow a stalk and not get an ear. I'm real good at that in Texas. So your harvest index goes down. Now the TR, the TR is a transpiration ratio. That's how much water is lost out of that leaf when you open the window to let the carbon dioxide in. How hot it is, how windy it is, how sunny it is, how dry the air is. And that number for corn can be on an average of about 220. It takes 220 pounds of water to produce a pound of dry matter. Now, if you're in a real human environment, like England, you might get by with 170 or 180. If you're in Texas, it might take 230 or 240 because Now that's for a corn crop, a, C, a C4 crop. Some of you will know what I'm talking about there, some you don't, and I don't know much about it either. But a C3 crop, like wheat, takes about one and a half times more water than a C4 crop like corn. Now, some of the breeders here may even want to challenge me here. That's great. But nobody has shown me yet where that has changed with new varieties. That's kind of a cost of doing business. If you go back to some of the old literature in the 1880s, German scientists published that it took 233 pounds of water to produce one pound of dry matter. It's 150 years ago, 140 years. Sinclair and Lewis said in 2010, for corn, for an average transpiration environment of two kilopascals, we won't go there, it took 220 pounds. <clears throat> My students and I have just published a paper that says it, for corn it took, under our conditions and the greenhouse, it's 216. Those numbers haven't changed. The way we measure that is we grow plants in boxes with lids on them so that the only water that can be lost is through the plant. We're measuring only transpiration. And 
And if we add water and grow plants with a lot of water, we get a lot of corn. If we add a little bit of water, we get a little bit of corn. But it took 220 pounds of water to grow a pound of whatever we grew. That ratio has not changed. And the people in England, I can show you the reference on that, they've got wheat where they released varieties 100 years ago and they grew just as much biomass 100 years ago as they're growing with the new varieties today. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the new varieties are not better. Don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is that they're not using the water any more efficiently for biomass production. Now, the goal of a dryland farmer is to use all the water available. But again, Pete talked about when is the water most important? Grain filling time. So if you're a dryland farmer, you cannot use all your water to grow stalks and not have any water left to grow grain. So you've got to ration it. And that ain't easy. Pardon the English, but that ain't easy. Now the other thing about this equation is it's a linear equation. You multiply one factor times another factor times another factor times another factor. So if you increase one factor 5%, you're going to increase grain yield 5%. The only way you're going to make big steps is to increase all of those. So that you multiply, if you increase each one of them by 5%, you've got 5 times 5 times 5. Now, this is hypothetical data, but it's based on pretty darn good judgment. I've used literature data. But the only point I want you to see here is... If we increase ET from 320 to 650, and this is going across the Corn Belt from western Nebraska at about 20-inch rainfall belt to eastern Ohio with 40-inch rainfall belt. But what I want you to notice there is as you increase ET, every one of those factors are being increased in a positive direction. And by doubling ET, you can increase yield about four times. Because you're increasing all those factors in the same positive direction. That's the reason we like to irrigate. You add as much irrigation water as you have rainfall, you quadruple your yields. You doubled your ET, but you quadrupled your yield because you increase every one of these factors. Now, if you're a dryland farmer and you do not have water to add, you have to live with what you've got. So the challenge is how you do that. Now, the thing I like about this equation is that you can look at that equation and say, okay, if I do this, 
what am I going to affect? Now, if you're dry land farming, the first thing you do, again, going to Pete. Pete, I'm glad you gave that talk. You're helping me a lot. <laughs> he talked about 30,000 corn plants. Well, you do that if you're an irrigated farmer. But if you're a dry land farmer, you can't do that. You've got to cut your population down. Okay, if you cut your population down, what are you going to affect? This ET now is fixed. So if you cut your population from here where it gets all burned up to here, look how much more bare ground you've got. So what did you affect? You affected this T over ET. You're gonna lose much more of your water as, as evaporation, and you're not gonna have enough for transpiration. And if you cut your population too much, you may not have enough root zone or root to use all your ET. You may lose some, leave some money in the bank. Or in our area, some farmers use skip rows. Well, if you use skip row, you're probably not going to use all the water out of between those rows, so you're not going to use all your ET. Your T over ET is going to be poor because you've got more briar ground. So you're sacrificing here, you're sacrificing here in order to improve your harvest index. You save some water to have some grain so you've got harvest index. But you gave up. So this is really a risk aversion. It's not a yield increaser. Now this is mulch. This is a win-win situation. This is where we've made some real strides, and, I, and you've done a wonderful job here. 75% of your land is no-till, I understand, from yesterday. Maybe more. So what do you do when you do that? You change this drastically. and you improve your harvest index. Now in China, they literally grow millions of acres of corn under plastic. They can do that because they've got very small farms and this is corn growing under plastic in a very low rainfall area. This is a kind of an exception, but if you look back here, you see what they're doing. They're, they're getting that T over ET as much as 9, 90%. 90% of the water that's available as ET, they're getting it in transpiration. Now they've got to have a small area so that the water doesn't run off. Now this is kind of a novel approach that we've been playing around with. I'm not trying to convince you to do this, but it's an idea somebody may want to try. We're growing 
corn in clumps in order to try to improve the microclimate, get those plants close together. Here's a farmer in Kansas or in uh, Colorado that's come to see me a couple of times. I haven't heard from him uh, in over a year, so he may have bogged down again. He has an idea whether he ever brings this to fruition or not. I, I have no, no idea, but he wanted to have a, a wheat planter in which he'd have plant, a wheat just four inches apart and put fertilizer down the middle. And then he'd have about 12 inches before he goes to the next paired rows. And then for corn, he wanted to have corn in clumps and put the fertilizer only where he had the corn plants. <laughs> the last challenge I want to mention just very briefly is climate change. We cannot escape the data showing that the world is getting hotter. Now we can argue about whether you and I are having any effect on that or whether it's just natural. But we can't escape the fact that it's getting warmer. This is the global temperature going back, and it's been going up, up, up. This year is by far going to be the hottest year on record. Uh, this is the temperature in the U.S., average for the entire U.S., and you can see here in the last number of years, uh, been considerably warmer. There's going to be winners and losers, and fortunately for you, I think you're going to be a winner. Unfortunately for me, I don't think that's going to work. This is a number of frost-free days that's been added. You're up here somewhere, you've probably added at least 10 days to your growing period. This is a chart I put together for the Texas High Plains. Our average temperature has been going up and our rainfall has been somewhat constant, although there's a somewhat of a trend downward a little bit, but uh, this is the winter temperatures. They seem to be changing more than the summer. We're just not getting those cold winters. And I brought a big coat to Lethbridge. <laughs> it's still in my suitcase. Of course, I haven't been outside, but uh, <clears throat> this is a month of March in the Texas High Plains. This is a month that I find the biggest difference. We haven't had a cold March in 30 years. My final thought goes back to soil health, and I just simply want to reemphasize what you've already heard. I think for soil health, keep these three principles in mind and you're on a good road. Minimum tillage, permanent soil cover, dead or alive, keep that soil covered. Crop rotation. Thank you very much.